The book of Jude may be short in length, but it begins and builds like a bold shout of strength. From a warning about false teachers and apostasy to contending for the faith with a sense of urgency, Jude's letter seeks to heighten the awareness of believers by drawing upon past biblical imagery as a way to frame their present reality. This admonishment is more than necessary for today, as dividers, dissenters, and deceivers have infiltrated the church and contaminated the truth. Thus, as Jude alludes, one can mark the error of a rebel when they know the truth of the Bible. And that is why the heart of this letter is not just about recognizing the red flags of what is apostate, but it's also an exhortation to contend earnestly to raise the flag of faith. So as we take a serious look into the book of Jude, let us know that these times of aggression against the truth require the same intensity from believers to protect the truth. All right, how many people have memorized that sermon bumper by now? I don't know about you, but it gets me excited to preach the Word of God as I hear the content of the book of Jude and, of course, the character of the letter. And that's what I want to look at as we jump into Jude, verses 22 and 23. If you're joining us for the first time, we're studying verse by verse through the book of Jude. It's 25 verses in its entirety. It's one of the shortest books in the Bible, often a book that's overlooked because it kind of falls in the shadow of Revelation. So you jump from 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and there's this little book called Jude, and then Revelation. But I've been surprised personally how much depth is within these 25 verses, how much theology, where it takes us in the Old Testament, some of the illustrations that Jude used, some of the extra biblical resources that he pulled from. Ultimately, how do you understand extra biblical resources? A line like Enoch's is certainly inspired by God because it's in the canon of scriptures that we have, but that does not make the entire book of Enoch inspired by God, right? Just as Paul would pull from secular writers or poets and he would put that line into his epistles. It's pretty awesome how truth is truth, ultimately. Now, Paul's with me for a second. I'd love to see tangible Bibles coming into the church. Phones are great. It's where we keep our sermon notes. But there's something about the tangible Bible when you have it in your hands and you're able to look at the text that the teacher is preaching. All right. Based on the degree by which you understand the death of Christ, that will determine the depth of how you live for Christ. In other words, some of us, we know that we've been saved or forgiven from our sins. But that guy's sins or that gal's sins are more egregious than my sins. I've never broken any of man's laws. I'm a good moral citizen. But I know I've lied and I know I've cheated and I know I've committed these other smaller sins. So then I live a Christian life to the degree that I understand Christ died for me, my little white lies, and I'm going, it's shallow. Because he didn't just forgive you from those sins that you wouldn't measure as egregious or reckless or dark compared to somebody else's, but he saved you from hell. So the sin, your sin, my sin, was leading us all to the same destination. Now, if I understand that, if I truly understand as much as depends on me while I'm on earth in this temporal life that Christ interrupted and intercepted my trajectory on my way to hell and then gave me eternity with him. Heaven, forgiveness here, eternal life thereafter, righteousness in my character because of what he did, not what I have done, not what I will do. You will be judged based on what Christ did on the cross. The last work that Christ did, that's remarkable because a lot of us might have family members who may have taken their final breath through, through something that 
would be considered you know, shameful. But they knew the Lord. We knew they knew the Lord, but we struggle with where are they? And I want to say to you that thank you, Jesus, that they're not being judged based on their final breath on earth. They're being judged based on it is finished. Jesus' final breath on earth before he died. And he would be resurrected, validating, affirming, solidifying everything the Bible says, who he is, who he was on earth, the word that became flesh, tabernacling with us, going to that cross to die for you, to save me. To the degree that I understand that death, that will determine the death by which I live this life. Okay, I'll tell you the title tonight, Snatched Out of the Fire. I guarantee you, you will have a passion and a clarity to want to snatch others out of the fire when you understand that you've been snatched out of the fire. You'll want to share that very same message that changed you from the inside out. You'll want to share it with those around you. I pray that each of us get more focused on sharing the gospel, that name of Jesus, with families, with friends, with strangers, with coworkers. However the Lord provides or however he opens up doors, that the name of Jesus would precede us. Here's my outline for the book of Jude. The first three verses are exhortation to contend. Jude begins with a salutation to the believers, this community. He talks about writing them about their common salvation. But something, the Holy Spirit, redirects him, and he begins to write about contending earnestly for the faith. Verses one through three are exhortation to contend. That is a fighting word. Verses four alone are the exploitation of God's grace. Who are they and what did they do? Why are we to contend for the faith? These guys have crept in unnoticed. They've snuck into the fellowship and they've turned the grace of God into lewdness. That's what verse four says. In other words, they took something that was beautiful and by their mismanagement of it, by their abuse of it, they tainted it and contaminated it. They turned the beautiful grace of God into licentiousness or lewdness, likely by sexual immorality or other forms of behavior that were antithetical to the good grace that saved them or seemingly saved them. Verses five to seven are examples of past apostates. Remember, when we looked at those verses, they took us backwards. First, Israel, an example of being delivered from Egypt and then grumbling and complaining and becoming apostate. Remember, to become apostate, it means to defect from a faith or a truth that you once were privy to. You can't be apostate unless you were once exposed to the truth. So the message and the letter is to the community of believers who are being infiltrated by fake or false believers, deceivers. Why? Because the enemy realized over the course of history, persecution from the outside in, the blood of the martyrs paved the way for the church to flourish. What? No weapon formed against the early church could prosper because whatever weapon that was fashioned or formed against them, God just began to expand the movement. Beginning in little old Jerusalem, look where it has reached today. That little message of the gospel. The enemy is like, I can't beat them from the outside in. I know how I can beat them from the inside out. Hence, the book of Jude. We learned about the angels as an example of the apostasy. And then eventually from the, is, the nation of Israel to the angels to Sodom and Gomorrah, a people who were exposed to the truth and they went the opposite direction. Verses eight to 16, an amazing body of this letter is the exposure. Now notice I'm using the word, the letter E, an X for my alliteration and my outline. Exhortation to contend, exploitation of God's grace, examples of past apostates, exposure of charlatans and spiritual con artists through a writing style 
that is like a forensic sketch artist. It's masterful writing. Jude, like a forensic sketch artist, would take every detail and he would be able to express it in such a way that when you're reading it or you're looking at the picture, you can almost see the characteristics of the person or the profile that he is trying to get the early church to be able to recognize. Does that make sense? How does he do it? Verse 12 and 13, he uses analogies. This is like a sub line to exposure of charlatans and spiritual con artists. How does he do it? Analogies. Analogies like what? Verses 12 and 13. Spots in your love feast, clouds without water, trees without fruit, raging waves, foaming up shame, wandering stars. He uses trajectories. What do you mean by that? That's verse 11. They're going the way, trajectory of Cain. They're running greedily in the error of Balaam. They are perishing in the rebellion of Korah. He moves quickly to verse 14 and 15, which is absolute execution of God's judgment. Execution of God's judgment. He uses Enoch's prophecy. Enoch is a character in the Old Testament. I believe it's twofold. I believe not only do we have access to Enoch's prophecy about the times we're living in, about God's judgment eventually dealing with the ungodly, but also Enoch, in my biblical opinion, is a picture or a foreshadow of the rapture, that right before the final judgment or tribulation, God is going to snatch his bride. He is going to take his church out of the way. I think Enoch is a picture of that. We move to verse 16 to 19, which is explicit acts of the apostates. If we have the acts of the apostles in the Bible, we have the acts of the apostates and these characteristics, they're grumblers, they're complainers. They walk in their lust. Remember I said it's a parallel of the opposite positive imperatives of the Christian. If they are grumbling and complaining, hey Christian, you should be praising and thanking. If they are walking in their lust, hey, Christian, you should be keeping yourself in God's love. If they are sensual, causing divisions because they are absent of the Holy Spirit, you should be full of the Holy Spirit. It's like, you see how they're living? Do the opposite. It's how Jude crafts verses 16 to 19. And as of last Thursday, exhortation to contend. He kind of comes back to how he began. Because all this letter, you're going, I thought you told me to contend for the faith. How do I do that? Q verses 12, or excuse me, 20 to 23, right? What is 20 to 23? Well, here it is on the screen. First and foremost, remember the spoken word. Remember it. Remember what the apostle said. Remember what the disciple said. Remember what the Bible says. Remember the spoken word. Hey, by the way, read the written word. Do not neglect the reading of the tangible written word of God. And by the way, pray in the spirit of the word. Your prayer life should be full of the word of God. In other words, I often hear the word supplication, prayer and supplication. I know what supplication means. It's the word supply. But what am I supplying heaven with? I think God answers his own word. So I supply heaven with heaven's word. God cannot deny his own word. So when I pray the word, God cannot not answer his word. Does that make sense? Can you say not and not in the same sentence? Yeah. Do not write me an email. I just self-corrected myself. I'm serious. They get me on that type of stuff. Okay, where are we? Finally, obey the truth of the word. Obviously, don't hear it, but be doers of it also and watch for the living word, right? The return of Christ, the living word, he's coming back, watching for the mercy or looking for that mercy. Finally, verses 24 and 25, which we will get to, Lord willing, when we're back together is the exclamation of praise in God's power. It's a doxology. It's an amazing doxology, often prayed at the end of services. We're going to look at that, verses 24 and 25. That's our outline for the book of Jude. Ultimately, those who contend for the faith must learn to discern the true faith from counterfaiths. So when I wrote down counterfaiths, I go, how do you describe counterfaiths? What is a counterfaith? There's other faiths out there. If you contend for the true faith, 
you should learn to discern counterfeits. And I looked at counterfeits and I was like, oh my gosh, a counterfeit's a counterfeit. It just kind of fit. Counterfeits. But how do you know the difference between the authentic and a counterfeit? People make a lot of money from selling the counterfeit version of a product. And there are several ways to be able to tell whether or not it's the authentic or if it's a counterfeit. One of the main ways to discern if it's a fake, guess what it is? The price tag. That's the main reason. If you got it at a reduced, discounted rate, a cheaper cost, you done did fooled. You've been fooled. <laughs> you wearing that Gucci or Louis Vuitton purse, and you got it on South Street, I'm just telling you the truth. It's the price tag. It's a cheapened version. The other way you can tell the counterfeit from the real deal is the quality. And the price tag and the quality go hand in hand. And I'm saying it's the same for the message of the gospel. Any message that has been cheapened and the quality or substance of the word. What do you mean by that? If a minister tells me that I can just come in, get saved by saying a prayer, and leave and live a life unchanged, that's a cheap version. That's a fake. That's a counterfeit. Right? Because a changed life from the gospel happens because you have a changed heart. And when your heart changes, church, there's nothing in your life that is the same. Not the music you listen to, not the programs you watch, not the language you use, not your responses. Now, I'm not saying there's going to be a perfect execution. I love what Matt Chandler says. He says, you will imperfectly execute the commandments of God. In other words, you want to apply them, but you're going to imperfectly stumble your way through them. Not perfectly. Christ did perfectly. You will imperfectly, but there's a desire. There's a new appetite, like the babe craving the breast. So should the believer want more of the milk of God's word. Like, does anybody crave the truth of the scriptures in a world and a culture that lies to you? Recognizing the truth. Being able to discern the lie. There's no way to do this other than the word of God. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 14, I took the last verse in this, contextually speaking, this buildup of about, hey, by this time, you should be teaching yourself. Now, of course, not in a pulpit like a pastor. That's a calling and that's an office. But he's saying every believer should be teaching the word of God teaching it to your children, teaching it to your spouse, teaching it to your friends, like in some form of fashion, conversationally, teaching the word of God. Even telling your testimony is a teaching of sorts. You're teaching somebody what God has brought you through and how thankful you are because of it. That's a teaching. He's like, you're still talking about the ABCs and the one, two, threes, that the Jesus that you say you love and serve died for you. He's like, that's good, but if it's true, then move on from that. Go deeper. Then he kind of talks about still wanting the milk, not a compliment at this point in Hebrews 5, but ultimately solid food, like meat, belongs to those who are of full age. Underline that in your mind or in your Bible and understand of full age is not about chronology. It means maturity. It's not about how long you've been a Christian. I know a lot of Christians who are advanced in age and they're fools. Right? Time in. I've been a Christian for 30 years, Pastor. Time in does not equate into maturity. I know some young believers chronology-wise, 16, you know, 20, that are mature. How did they get there? It tells us, by reason of use. That means practice. That means habit forming. What is the result? Having their senses exercised. Senses, of course, we understand. 
how you see, how you feel, how you hear, how you smell. Those are senses, right? Now, spiritually speaking, are your ears being sharpened or honed to hear the voice of God? Because Jesus said, if you're my sheep, you will know my voice. And you will not respond to a fraud. You'll discern my voice from a hireling's. Somebody who does not care about the sheep. They're here, but when danger comes, they run. They self-preserve. How about your eyes? Are your spiritual eyes being exercised, sharpened? The word exercise is related to the word gymnasium, right? So we understand when you work out, you build muscle, you develop He's saying the same thing. The senses, spiritually speaking, will be developed. You will build spiritual fiber and muscle the more you spend time in the Bible, but not just reading it academically, spending time with the author intimately. You know what I'm talking about? Because back in the day, I was raised in a strong Christian household. My parents trained up, me and my three older brothers, in the word, in the church. They exemplified their Christian walk by living for Christ. They didn't just talk about it. They lived about it. I knew all that. I could quote Psalm 23 by memory, but I did not know the shepherd of Psalm 23 intimately. (laughs) Huge gap. Huge gap from the pew. And I wonder how many are sitting in the pew and the pew is nothing but a gateway to hell. And your fact, you're sitting in the shadow of death and it's gripping you. And you're claiming him as the shepherd, but you've never given him your life because you don't understand his death. Exercise. And this is the result. Discern between good and evil. Like somebody wrote me one time and they were like, how are you able to tell the difference between what's happening in our world? I'm like, I have a living lie detector that lives inside of me, the Holy Spirit. Like when I hear something or see something, I'm like, oh, that, that, that doesn't line up with the word. Like that's off, what's happening over there in the world. Like, yeah, something's in motion. That guy, his voice, he's nothing but a parrot for the prince of the power of the air because what he just said is in alignment with the prince of darkness, not the king of light. And I have a discernment to know it. Okay, know the difference between good and evil, between righteousness and unrighteousness, between light and dark, between truth and error because you're gonna need it. You're going to have to draw a line of distinction according to verse 22, right? If you're building up your faith on the word, you are praying in the Holy Spirit. You're keeping yourself in the love of God. You're looking for Christ and you're living for him. You're going to have a desire, as I said earlier, or a passion to have compassion. Verse 22, and on some have compassion, making a distinction. Interesting insertion here, Jude adds it. Why? Because previously he's talking about these spiritual liars. You remember them, right? The entire body of the letter is written about those that have gone apostate and how much damage they're causing to the fellowship. Now he is dealing with those who may have been influenced negatively by their teachings or by their lifestyle. He is now saying, hey guys, hey, they're marked out for condemnation. Remember he said that earlier? Like they're unsalvageable. They're perishing in the rebellion of Korah. But there are those who are following them have compassion. Try to reach them before it's too late. Who are these? I ask, who are these that we should have compassion on and draw a line or make a distinction? Now, let me stop. I guarantee there are many versions of the Bible in this room. These two verses come with controversy. There are so many translations of these two verses. I'm just preparing you because I might read a version that you're going, wait a second. Categorically speaking, Jude's talking about three types of categories. I'm the New King James Version. My version has two categories. So whether it's three types of audiences or two, really the aim's the same. 
There are those who are doubting. They are stumbling. They might be persuaded by false teaching, the tickling of the ears. It sounds good. It looks good. Jude's like, have compassion on them. These, I believe, may know conversion. These types of people know conversion. What are they lacking? Conviction. It's why they're vacillating. It's why they're doubting. It's why they're here one day and gone the next and back again. And you're wondering where they're at. And they're now caught by the wave or the wind of a new teaching. And it's like, they're all over the place. He's like, hey, when they come back, one, reach them. Two, have compassion. This idea behind compassion is mercy. They're wavering. Perhaps these are those that are ensnared by the original ploy of Lucifer. His original ploy in Genesis chapter three, has God indeed said? That's ultimately what pulls people off absolute truth. Did God really say that? Like, is that really in the Bible? No, it's in the Bible. Yeah, but did he really mean it that way? Like, that's an ancient book. That's outdated. Get with the times, man. Like, don't you see the culture? What was considered immoral back in the day is now acceptable to today. So no, no doubt the Bible has to kind of apply to the times, right? News flash. Truth transcends the times. So no. Truth is truth. I know it. And those who are wavering, 2 Peter chapter 2, right, is the parallel chapter to Jude. If you read 2 Peter chapter 2, the language is so similar. I believe, based on more studying, that Jude pulled from Peter. I believe Peter wrote his epistle first. He talked about the apostasy, and I believe Jude used his letter as a reference, and that is why the language is very similar. But Peter adds something that's not in Jude. Talking about these apostates, he says, verse 14, 2 Peter 2, 14, who are they trying to reach? Enticing, unstable souls. Spiritual liars can't influence stable souls. When you know the word and you know who you are in Christ, I don't care what the world says. I don't care what you say. I know what God says. But there are those, now I'm going to take imagery or a metaphor from James, different context, but James is like, hey, those that doubt, they're like the waves. They're like tossed to and fro. Now think about that. Peter's like, they're enticing unstable souls. Jude is like, have compassion on those that are in, unstable, they're wavering. Think about the waves that are crashing in somebody's mind. If they don't allow the book to anchor their souls, those waves will eventually lead to a drowning of sorts. So there are people that are teetering. They're here, and the Bible's like, hey, have a distinction and a discernment to know that that person needs you to reach them because they're about to leave the faith. Is your head on a swivel in such a way that you go, you know what, that guy said that one thing that sounded like a teaching that he should not be flirting with, and if he keeps tuning into that one YouTube teacher that has a lot of followers and a lot of views, and he's very popular, but there's no depth to his teaching, it's nothing but cotton candy, if he keeps tuning into that, he is gone like the wind. You understand what I'm saying? So what do we do? I believe two things. With conviction, reach those who have been deceived. Like you, unwilling to move, you reach the one who has been deceived. Number two, with compassion, receive those who have been deceived. There are those who will come back, and what they do not need is you and I to be judgmental, how dare you? They're gonna come back with their tail between their legs. They've been deceived. And I'm saying, the posture is, hey, welcome back. We've missed you. Let's, let's get you involved in a connect group. Let's surround you with solid believers. Let's have you discipled in the scriptures. That's what's needed. And as a recipient of God's grace, Jude verse two, right? Let grace and mercy and love abound. Like, let it just be 
poured out on you and in you and overflow through you. You've received grace. And verse 21, you're looking for grace. And in between receiving grace and looking for grace, hey, how about you show some grace? Right? Write this down or remember it. The mercy you know will determine the mercy you show. You'll give mercy because you know mercy. Remember, mercy is perhaps keeping somebody from what they deserve. God kept you from what you deserve, and I want to pay that forward. How do I do that? Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are, some versions say spiritual, the translation is godly, you who are godly or aligned with God, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. So there are those who are overtaken, overpowered, overcome by sin or temptation or, or a snare of sorts. False teaching can be included. They've been taken. You who are close to God, spiritual, restore them with a spirit of gentleness. You ever seen somebody pop somebody's dislocated shoulder back in? I don't know if that's a spirit of gentleness. And I don't know why I just said that. That's what came to my mind. No, you do do it with a spirit of gentleness. Sometimes it hurts. You understand what I'm like? You don't just recklessly, like, come on, come on, boom. No, there's, there's a spirit of gentleness to it, but you, you want to get that dislocated shoulder back in its place. That's the word restore here. Franny, right? <laughs> he messed his shoulder up. This is how we do it, right? To restore people back to the body, to the faith. Verse 23, quickly. So there are those we have compassion on, a mercy. We make a distinction. There are those who are doubting. They are vacillating. They're wavering. Like Paul wrote to the Galatians, restore them with a spirit of gentleness, receive them with open arms. But verse 23, there's like this transition to compassion to caution. Now, I don't want you to think that the caution lacks compassion, but there's a different intensity here. Some people, they realize, they come to their senses, they come back, they really just kind of maybe smell like the smoke before the fire, of sin. Does that make sense? It's like they were playing with it, but they got out in time and they came back. They were kind of, you know, ensnared. There are some people, verse 23, but others save sozo with fear, pulling them out of the fire. I'll read the rest of the verse. Hating even the garment defiled by the flesh, but pulling them, snatching them out of the fire. Save with fear. This idea behind fear is not a godly fear. You can make the case that it should be godly, but I'm saying this is the idea of have caution when you're about to proverbially run into a burning building because the danger, what you're trying to save somebody from could be the same danger that takes you out. Do you understand what I'm saying? Before you cross the street to push somebody out of the way, you better make sure you make it across the first lane because the car that's about to hit you is gonna take you out and that car is gonna take them out. Save with fear. Snatching out of the fire. What does this take? Caution. Caution. Some of you might know this, many of you probably don't, but this past weekend, our very own Jesse Stokes, wherever he's at in here, was in the ocean, and another young man began to drown. And Jesse <laughs> responded, and he swam over, and he seeks to save this young man who's drowning. And the young man, obviously panicking, began to take Jesse down. So Jesse had to actually push himself off to regain his composure before going in again 
and literally saving somebody from drowning. That young man was eventually taken out. Yeah, make sure you tell Jesse, that's like, that don't, that don't happen to everybody. Young man went to the hospital, was a very serious, was almost dead, and then eventually was released from the hospital either yesterday or today. But the idea is that's a spiritual intervention. That analogy is a spiritual intervention. There are those who are drowning, and they don't want to drown. But the danger is when you go to save them, they don't want to be saved. They can take you under. In fact, some of these people that are trained to save drowning victims are even equipped to hit them, to knock them out, so they then can save them. And I am not advocating in any way, shape, or form <laughs> for that. Spiritually, I am. <laughs> that the pastor said. Right, let's look at some verses that kind of help us understand. What does it mean to save with fear, pulling out of the fire? 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 23 to 26 to set the context. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. It's not about debating or arguing, knowing that they generate strife. You want to save someone? Don't get into a debate or argument about how they're living or what they're you know, currently ensnared by. They're not going to understand. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth, verse 26, and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Did you ever know that was in the Bible? There are those who are prisoners of the devil and they're carrying out his will unaware. There are those who are literally shackled by the shadow of hell. They are those who are waiting for us to save them with caution, snatching them out of the fire. We understand, we understand physical interventions. If anybody had a family member who needed to be intervened on because of a vice, because of alcohol or drugs, you don't tell them you're planning an intervention they walk into it, but you're there because you care and you love and you want to see them set free, right? That's how that works. They might turn on you. They might feel betrayed. They might get angry and hostile, but you know in your heart, you're trying to save them. You understand they're gripped by a darkness or a bondage, something we understand that physically, right? And I'm going, shouldn't there be an intensity spiritually in that same direction for those who, according to Paul to Timothy, are snared of the devil? James 5, 19 and 20, same idea here, ready? Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, someone who turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Verses read are hard or different than applied, right? So how do I do that? I just have to be ready to share the truth and allow the consequences to fall as they may. Interestingly, we already covered this story about Lot as the illustration of Sodom and Gomorrah from earlier shows us a man named Lot and angels came to deliver Lot and his family in verse 16 in chapter 19 of Genesis it's kind of this idea here. Remember, Lot is comfortable in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he has given this opportunity to be delivered. And it says in verse 6, and while he lingered, Lot lingered, the men took hold of his hand, angels, his wife's hand, like, come on, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. That's why. And they brought him out and set him aside the city. Guess where he was standing before he gets delivered? In the shadow of the fire. Because guess what fell momentarily after he was delivered? Fire and brimstone. This idea behind an angel coming and literally is snatching them and going, let's go. This place is about to burn. Why are you just sticking and standing around? Like, 
This should be the intensity in the believer when we see loved ones and family members and friends who are in the fire and we need to save them with fear and we need to go in and do whatever we can to take them out. And yeah, they might turn on you and yeah, they might call you a bigot and a hypocrite and you're a this and a that, but I'm saying, hell? You, you feel betrayed? I don't want you to burn in hell. Back to the word save, because it's attached to the salvation that only God can accomplish. Interestingly, right? That's how it's meant. But others save with fear. Notice, you are to save, but I thought I can't save anyone. And I'm going, you can't. We can save no one, but when's the last time you saved someone? And it doesn't contradict itself. Like, you can save no one. Only God can do that. But when's the last time you saved someone? Jesse, don't raise your hand right now, dude. <laughs> like, no, seriously, when's the last time, and I, I'm talking to myself, when's the last time I was instrumental in being used by God to help save someone? When's the last time I grabbed somebody and said, no, you're coming to church? <laughs> No, 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 this isn't a request. You're coming to church with me. You need to sit in the pew and hear what the pastor has to say. No, 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 this is good for you. When's the last time we've saved, been a part of the process to bring people to the Lord and leave the consequences and the outcome to God? No doubt there is danger in this verse to the sinner, but there's also even a danger to the rescuer. That's what it says. A doctor who seeks to cure an infectious disease, they run the risk of infection themselves. So they don't operate recklessly. There's wisdom here. But notice the rest of the verse kind of helps you understand. Save with fear. Pulling them out of the fire. Why? Hating even the garment defiled by the flesh because I see the destructive nature of sin. I hate what it has done to me. I see what it's doing to you. I hate even the garment that's defiled by that lifestyle. Jude is actually using a word that is speaking of underpants, underwear, not overwear, underwear. Because remember, there's this idea behind sexual immorality is running rampant in this community because they believe they could do whatever they want with their body because God has saved the soul. So he is like kind of using a play on words and saying, hate even the garment that they were wearing when they committed the sin. But he's also using Levitical law, not applying it, but he's taking from Leviticus chapter 13, verses 47 to 55, 52, excuse me, which speaks of a infectious disease or a leprous disease. We know about leprosy in the Bible. And even the leprosy of the skin would defile the clothing. So when they came to get cleansed, they had to throw away and burn the clothing. So he's like, do you understand that biblically in Levitical law? You understand that even the garment of that lifestyle is defiled? Hate it. But if you don't hate it, you're not gonna care to wanna save them from it. And we have become a culture that has desensitized itself to sin, right? Some of us in this room, not me, have been alive long enough to know that the trajectory of what was once considered acceptable and what is once conservative today Think about the language that you were exposed to on television, in movies, what was censored, to what you have access to on mainstream TV. Your children can scroll through and hear more curse words or more profanity on social media or on Netflix, and that they'll rate it G, general audience. Why? Because we've become desensitized. We no longer call sin, sin. 
We are a culture that has turned the confession of sin into the celebration of sin. And if you don't believe me, this entire month is dedicated to the celebration of sin. Hate the, the, the garments that are even defiled. Some of those videos I'm seeing, they're not even wearing any garments. What? I have my kid being read a book by a drag queen? And yet, the church and the Christian, we often say, you know what, man, don't go so hard on that or them or sin because God says, pastor, love the sinner but hate the sin, right? And I get that, trust me, because this verse right here, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh, is the closest to that mantra, love the sinner, hate the sin. But if you don't understand what that means biblically, you can use that phrase to justify sin. It's what we do. It's Christian virtue signaling. I love the sinner though. I hate the sin. No, but leaving someone in their sin, that's not loving. That's loathing. That's like hating them. And yet we let the world convince us that we shouldn't speak truth, always in love. But you don't have to worry about how they're judging your heart. Because if you really want to see their soul saved, I don't care if you think I'm being judgmental. I don't care if you think I'm being critical. I don't care if you think I'm being hateful. I want your soul saved. That's why I have breath in my lungs. So what do we do? We, we change the Bible and softening the Bible and what it says is not loving, it's called lying. I recently, the amount of times somebody has said to me, whether by email or direct message on social media, that I should stop throwing stones. You know, they're quoting John chapter 8. It's the woman pulled out of her bed, caught in the act of adultery. And the religious leaders, of course, are trying to test Jesus. It wasn't about her. She was a pawn. Hey, Jesus, law says she deserves to be stoned. What say you? Jesus is a master, right? He knew the law. I know what the law says. Bends down, draws this line. We don't know what he writes. Stands up, says this. Whoever amongst you without sin, you throw the stone first. So we take that one line and we throw it at people. Stop judging, you're throwing stones. And I'm saying to that, it's faulty because calling out sin is not the same as casting a stone. Let me say that again. Calling out sin is not the same as casting a stone. Casting a stone is executing judgment, not ours to administer. Calling out sin is affirming what the judge meant. That is required of a minister. Let me say that again. Casting a stone is executing judgment. That's not ours to administer. That's God's. Calling out sin, that's affirming what the judge meant. That is the job of a minister. And, and it's harder today where good is called evil and evil is called good and what is moral is immoral and what is immoral is moral and light is dark and dark is light. So you're calling out light as light and they're calling you a bigot or a hater or a judgmental and you're casting stones and you stop speaking truth because you're worried about what they say as if you're running for president of popular opinion. I lost that election a long time ago. So what do we do? Romans 12, 9. Abhor what is evil. Adore what is good. C cling to what is good. That's what it says. Romans 12, cling to what is good. Like cleave, hold on to what is good. Because if you don't cling to what is good, what is not good will cling to you. That's how that works. Because the magnet of the flesh, if you don't cling to what is good, what is not good will cling to you. Personally and practically, Psalm 101, verse 3, I want this to be the cry of my heart. 
I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. Those who depart and bring people with them. It shall not cling to me. How awesome is that? Like that is not going to cling to me. Why? Because I don't even want that stuff on the garments that I wear. Because I want to know what it means to hate even the garments defiled by the flesh. I want to live a lifestyle that's pure in God's sight because the Holy Spirit is cleansing me from the inside out. I want to be a believer who clings to the one who came to claim, right? Because you were lost. If you've lost something at this church, we have a lost and found bin in the breezeway. And you come back and you say, I lost my cell phone. I lost my coffee mug. We say you can go claim it. And the reason you came back to get what, what was lost is because to you it has value. And I'm saying each of us were lost And Christ looked down and said, there's value in that lost treasure. And I'm willing to give up everything to come purchase that plot of land so that I can dig it up because they don't even know what's inside of them. And then Jesus tells these stories that include three pictures of the nature of God, Luke 15. And he begins by talking of a shepherd who leaves 99 to go out and salvage and save the one. He goes, the 99 are secure, they're fine, but the one is lost and there's value in the one. So I'm going to go out and bring it back. And then he tells a story of a woman who loses a coin and the coin has value to her so she doesn't say i got nine other coins she turns her house upside down the sofa the table and there it is why because it has value and she calls her neighbor and says that coin i lost i found it and they have a celebration and i'm saying that's what happens when one sinner repents and is saved by god or saved through the body of christ and then finally the father because the shepherd's the son and the woman's the spirit, and now the father. And the father has two sons. And one son goes. The father doesn't chase him. But the father waits for him. The father does not change his love for the son. There were probably consequences. And I know that personally from the son's choices in the world. But when he made up his mind, it says he came back to himself And he came home, and I believe the initial thoughts of his heart were rehearsed. I got an idea. I'd be better off as a slave in my father's house than a king here in the world. But that lifestyle of thinking I'm something when I'm not has led me into a pig pen. And now my garments are dirty, and I'm unworthy to even be called a son but I know what I'll do. I'll go home and I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Take me back as a slave. And I believe that was a rehearsal until he got home and saw the authentic love of the Father. And it went from a rehearsal to true brokenness and repentance because what was lost was now found, salvaged, snatched from the fire, restored as a son to the Father. That's Luke chapter 15. And we were on our way to hell too. And Christ snatched us out of that fire. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 tells us, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Translation, he who was not wearing filthy rags, garments defiled, decided to subject himself to garments that were defiled. But not only that, he took the rags of your wretchedness and then he wrapped you in the robe of his righteousness. And by wrapping you in the robe of his righteousness, you are now seen as justified by God. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you think you've done. I don't care what they said you've done. If you give your life to Christ and you understand he snatched you out of the flames 
of hell, and he's then given you his life in return and his righteousness and his presence of the Holy Spirit. You are no longer what you've done. You are now who God says that you are. Like, I want to share that with the world. Like Dawson Trotman, you know who he is? He was the founder of the Ministry Navigators. That ministry was passionate about discipleship. Why? Because he saw a lot of ministries like Billy Graham's ministry that focused on evangelism. A lot of people were getting saved, but there was nothing more than sign this piece of paper with an email and a phone number, and there was no follow-up. There was no discipleship. And he'd go, where are all these people? If the revival was what they said it was and people were at the altar, then where is the revival in the world? So he started a ministry about holding people up and accountable. And he was invited to speak at Word of Life Camp, Scroon Lake. And on the off day, June 18th, June 18th, it's coming up, 1956, they went out there on Scroon Lake to Wooderski. Him, Jack, the founder of Word of Life, couple campers. One young lady could not swim. He asked her, can you swim? She said no. So he changed seats with her so that she was on the inside of the boat. They hit a bump or a swell on the lake and the boat kind of flopped them out. And Dawson went out into the water and this young girl went out into the water and he remembered that she couldn't swim. So he ran or swam over to her. And as he is holding her up for the boat to make a U-turn and eventually make its way back, he was able to hoist her up in the water as they salvaged her back into the boat. And Dawson went under slowly only to die because they didn't find him in that moment. Billy Graham did his funeral, and he said this, Dawson died the same way he lived, holding others up. And I'm saying to you, church, would you live the way Dawson died, holding others up that are drowning, that need to be saved and snatched out of the flame? I would love to know what church looked like if we got that. And there's more for us to do. How do I know that? Because since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard this. By God's grace, let's do this. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, the one who came to save, thank you that he chose us and then gave us the spiritual wherewithal and will to choose him back. Thank you that you are a great God that gives us mercy so we can show mercy. So I pray that compassion lives within our hearts for us to receive those who are deceived, to reach those who are deceived, to snatch those who are in the shadows of hell, currently shackled by sin, but to save them with fear and caution and even hating the garments that are defiled by the flesh because we hate what you hate and we love what you love. So we want to hold people up, hold truth up, hold the gospel up, Hold the name of Jesus up. So as we lift you up, oh God, we ask that you increase and we decrease. This is your church. We are your bride. In the name of Jesus, amen.